Because you told me you didn't want to get married. You to, I, I, I told I, you I didn't want to get you, I didn't want to get married, and then you went to Toronto, and your mom and you picked out a wedding dress. No, see, men can never be trusted with the details. You told me you didn't want to get married, you didn't want to have children. You didn't, not that you didn't want to marry me. In general, you were against the institution of marriage <laughs> and children because you were an artist. I was quite a dysfunctional kind of guy. All I did was work, and I sort of stayed away from people. I lived like a like a hermit, kind of, in, uh, in my house in Hollywood, and I just I worked every day. Yeah. And, uh, and you, were at a, you were at a very labor-intensive, ambitious time of yeah. your life. You were just about to put a new record out, and, and yeah. uh, I understand workaholism, and I understood what, what he was saying to me was he didn't have the space. In his, he did love me. He told me he loved me, but he didn't have space in his life for a relationship. And I knew you wanted this, children as well, yeah. and I wasn't sure I, I wanted kids, and of course they're the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. Yeah, yeah. When I touch your hand, I fall from grace. I just fall after a year of friendship and six months of dating, at 26, Amy was looking for a commitment from Mark, a 38-year-old singer-songwriter who had always lived alone with his music. She gave me an ultimatum. She said she was out of there unless I, unless I was going to marry her and have children. And I said, well... Why don't we split it down the middle? I'll marry you without kids. And she said, no, I want to have children. And uh, she gave me, I think, 48 hours to come up with the proper answer. 21 days, dear. I don't think so. But whatever it was, <laughs> it went by in a twinkling. And uh, I uh, didn't want to lose you, so I gave in. And I'm still giving in. My ultimatum was... If you're really not the marrying kind, then let me go. Not marry me or I'm out of here. It's like, I want to respect your life path. If this is your life path, just let me know and I'll move on. This one night, we were actually, we were lying in bed. And, I, and it was like getting to midnight of the day. And I said, I just turned to Mark and I said, so? And he said, so what? And I said, so? Have you decided? I honestly had no idea. I had no idea if he was going to say he wanted to be with me or if he was going to move to London and be, be a hermit. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then he said, yes. And then I said, but um, you haven't asked me anything. And, he, and he, Mark said, well, I don't know what to say. I've never asked anyone to marry me before. I said, will you marry me? <laughs> and I don't even, they, they weren't, you could hardly even form the I mean, the it sounds words. so stupid now, doesn't it? It sounds so stupid. Honestly, I didn't even know what to do. It was a huge deal for you. It was oh, huge. huge. It was huge. It was huge. like, you could see, You should like, see our <laughs> wedding photographs. <laughs> they got married on New Year's Eve. They were living in Los Angeles, but they came back to Toronto. Um, Mark was in a sustained deer in headlights pattern from when they arrived in Toronto at the beginning of December until after they married. And I think it took him about a year and a half to wake up and go, what did I do? Mark was basically in a state of shock from, <laughs> from the day that we got married, you know, I'd say for a couple of years afterwards. I can't remember the wedding. I was so freaked out. It was a wonderful wedding. It was a very emotional wedding. It was a, it was a small wedding we had at Amy's house with all my cousins and her huge family and my brothers just for for the first 7 years of their marriage the couple lived in Los Angeles 3 years after the wedding in 1990 Amy gave birth to their first child Zoe. I think children bring angels. Uh, uh, they, they bring you luck. They bring, they change everything. They change your priorities. They, they open a door, the big love door. 
and, and, a, and, a, and a kind of love that you can't experience any other way. It's not the same as the love for your wife or your family, you know, your mother or your father or your brothers or your sisters. It's, it's a love that is only there for your children. It was wonderful for me to experience that. And the words I love you rolling off my tongue Never will I roll Cause I know my place is home. Up next on Country Couples, Rod Stewart takes Mark to number one around the world and life at home in Toronto. Life is slipping away Life may still be alive Somewhere, some way Running under cover Of a helicopter blade The flames are getting higher We had some financial problems right at the beginning and then things just got really great. It was as if Zoe was put here to when Zoe was three months old we <laughs> to bail me out of financial broke. ruin really she was sitting on the dining room table in her little rocker we were sitting there going we have no money <laughs> and the phone rang and it was Rod Stewart's producer saying that you know he'd cut one of Mark's songs and six weeks later it was a number one hit in 25 countries and it really changed our life oh yeah I got lightning in my veins Drinking like the handle on a slot machine I'll never forget the day he came over to my place in Hollywood. We were living about two streets apart. And he came over and he said, guess what? I said, what? He said, I got a rod. <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell you what I said after that, but... <laughs> he then explained to me what exactly that meant. Oh, the rhythm of my heart is beating like a drum and the words I love you rolling off my tongue. It changed our lives financially, it, not, but it didn't change us. I, I mean, it didn't change us. I, I grew up around this business, and I know what goes up must come down, and what goes down often comes up again. You know, it's a, you know, career path is like that. And, uh, and I'd been up and down enough times, and um, I was just thankful. I was just thrilled. I, I loved the way Rod did it, and, I, and uh, I had a family and a wife to share it with, and uh, I think at that point we decided soon after to move back to Toronto. It took a couple of years to finally make the move to Toronto, and shortly after they did, their son Ezra was born. I really never felt more Canadian than when I was, was in L.A., and, and, it, and the longer I lived there, the more I felt the pull back to Canada. I don't think you did as strongly as I did. You hadn't been away as long? No. I, well, I, I'd been away 10 years by the time we, we'd moved back, but I wasn't, I wasn't ready to leave the business in L.A., but with the little kids, I really wanted to be around my family. And my father was not well, and I wanted to be near him, and Mark's mother was recently widowed, and we wanted to be near her. and. So, um, yeah, family was the reason that we moved back and to raise our kids in Canada. Oh, the rhythm of my heart. Rod Stewart's success with Rhythm of My Heart made Mark Jordan an in-demand songwriter. He was soon getting cuts by many artists, including Joe Cocker, Cher, Amanda Marshall, and Bette Midler. This is an easy thing for me to say. They're two of the loveliest people I know. They, uh, creatively speaking, uh, are amazingly talented as individuals and um, just two of the sweetest people I know. I'm really happy to have them as friends. Eighteen years after they first met, Amy and Mark are still very much in love and as busy as ever. Amy writes and performs and releases her albums on her own label and Mark continues to write for others and has a record deal with the jazz label Blue Note. And most importantly, they've been busy raising their kids. He really connects with his kids. He 
put places a value on spending time, quality time with them, and um, loves exposing them to new experiences, especially at the cottage. He loves to explore with them, taking the boat ride and and go explore little hidden islands. And he he's very very um, emotionally available to them, and. Uh, looks them in the eye when he talks to them and they know that he is completely accessible to them and uh, and that he gets them and it's a wonderful it's a wonderful legacy to give to a child having it think of what we turned you from an emotionally inaccessible <laughs> hermit an island to you know the guy that the kids a run weeping, to weeping slobbering <laughs> Jellyfish. So nice. They're a little big. Oh my gosh, they're so great. And they're blue. They're neutral. They go with everything. Amy understands people deeply. It, it runs in her family. Her mother is a gifted psychologist. And Amy, I think, learned a lot from her mother and inherited that that desire to connect with people and she, I, that is my that's a huge deficit with me and she taught me how to be a dad and and I learned so much from watching her be a mother and can how to connect with those kids in a in a deep meaningful way and and uh, uh, I mean she, she deserves the credit for Two incredible children. Three, really. <laughs>